Okay, Rabbi Isai, we're in a part of the Agadah and the Gemara, and the, at the bottom of the Ayin Ches Amid Beis, where <clears throat> the Gemara had been discussing a story that happened in the times towards the end of the reign of David HaMelech, where there was a plague, and uh, this, um, a, a, a drought, I should say, and there was no... Uh, well, I beg your pardon? Oh, okay. Different from different from the. Uh, okay. Okay. So different different from the first the first stuff today. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, Shlosha Simonim Halalu. So the 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 reason why Hakadosh Baruch Hu had brought this plague to the Jewish people for three years was because of their lack of compassion to the Givonim. The Givonim are known as the Nasinim by the Mishnah, and the Gemara is telling us the background why you're not allowed to marry a Nasin, why they're not allowed to enter into the congregation of Hashem. The answer is, is because David HaMelech made this decree based on the cruel character of the Givonim. And what was the cruel character? They had been oppressed by Shaul HaMelech. Shaul had destroyed Novi or Kohanim, thus leaving all of the Givonim unemployed and not having a source of income, without any compassion towards the consideration of the Givonim, and therefore the Givonim demanded vengeance, they demanded justice. David felt that in order to be able to stay the plague, he would have to allow the Givonim to have justice, and therefore he told them, tell me what you want me to do, they said, give us seven, this is recorded in Shmuel Bey's chapter 21, they said, give us seven descendants of Shaul HaMelech. David tried to mollify them, tried to appease them, tried to get them to back down. They absolutely refused. And so as a result, David HaMelech said, Shlosha simonim halalu ro'i lihidabik bu'umazu. There are three character traits that a person must have in order to be worthy of attaching himself to the Jewish nation. What are these three character traits that all the Jewish people possess? It says, um, um, well, we, we saw yesterday, the Gemara had said that the three character traits are Rachmanim, Baishanim, and Gomlei Chasadim. Rachmanim, Dirsi, Venosan, Lecha, Rachamim, Vericham, Chavi, Herbecha. That how do you know that, uh, that Rachmanus, compassion for others, is a necessary component because Hashem says after the mitzvah of Yeranidachas, Hashem will give you rachamim. Baishanim dirse ba'avur tia yirasu al penechem that the Baishanim is to be shamefaced, is to have a sense of shame. This we learn from the fact that Hashem says that the fear of God will always be on your face as the Jewish people. And gomle chasadim dirse v'laman asher yitzav is bana v'yas beiso that Hashem says about Avraham, I know that he's going to charge his future descendants Lasos tzedakah umishpa to do charity and justice. This is another form of chesed, and so therefore the Jewish people have to have these characteristics. Kol alalu roi Only someone who has these character traits is worthy of being attached to the nation of Israel. And because the Givonim failed to display this compassion, this rachmanus, therefore David decreed that they had the status of slaves and therefore cannot marry into the Jewish people. Now we go continue the story of what David did in order to allow vengeance to be achieved by the Givonim, against Shaul's family. The Pasuk then says, that David, I mean, yeah, David took the two sons of Ritzpah, who was the daughter of Ayah, that had given birth to that had given birth to Shaul. I guess these are his grandchildren, and their names were Armoni and Mephibosheth. And then he took Veschameshes bnei Michal ba Shaul, Asher Yoldo leAdriel ben Barzilai hamecholasi. And then he took the, the five sons of Michal ba Shaul, uh, when she had given birth to uh, for Adriel ben Barzilai. He takes these five children, um, and I'm not sure. Whether this is the same Michal Bashol, I'm, I don't. I'm not sure because Michal was married to David, so maybe these are her grandchildren. I'm not sure, but in any event, he takes seven grandchildren of Shaul Hamelech, and what does he do? He he gives them over to the Givonim. The Givonim summarily execute them, and then they hang them on a tree. 
So the Gemara first asks, my honey, why did he choose Dafka these seven when there were plenty of other descendants of Shaul? So Amar of Huna, Avirum Lifnei Aron, Kol Sha'aron Kolto Lemisa, Kol Sha'in Aron Kolto Lechaim. So Rav Huna says that David did a supernatural test. He passed each one of Shaul's descendants before the Aron Kodesh. Anyone that was chapped by the Aron, the Aron had some kind of miraculous effect that's sort of like a magnetic pull that if you would not, if you were chapped by the Aron, that you couldn't move once you came into the proximity of the Aron, you couldn't be released. That was a sign that you were designated for death. And anyone who was able to walk free of the Aron's pull was allowed to go free. This was a sign that basically you were arrested for this, for this designated purpose. So, Masiv Ravchana Bar Ketina, Vayachmol HaMelech Al Mephiboshes Ben Yehona Son Ben Shol Shalo Heviro. So the Gemara says, what are you going to do with the Pasuk that says that David HaMelech had compassion on the son of Yehonasan, whose name was Mephibosheth? If you're telling me that David passed everyone before, then you see it wasn't, it wasn't within David's, it wasn't David's decision making, it was Hashem. So the Gemara answers, Shalo HaEviro, that David just decided not to take Mephibosheth and pass him before the Aram. He spared him. And the reason is, is because David had a special bond with Yehonasan, so he didn't want Yehonasan's son to be chosen. So v'chimaso panim yesh badavar, but that's not fair. How could David play favorites? Let Hashem choose. It was really should have been up to Hakadosh Baruch Hu. Ela sheheviro v'kolto ubikesh al avracham imupolto. So the Gemara says what happened was is that he passed him before the Aron. The Aron selected him, and David davened. And through his prayers, the Aron released him. Ve'akati maso panim yesh badavar. But that's still playing favorites. If Hashem had already chosen him and selected him for execution, what right did David have to interfere? So Ella Shabikesh Rachmim So the Gemara's answer is it's not that David passed him before the Aaron, the Aaron selected him, but rather David davened before he passed Mephibosheth before the Aaron, saying, Please Hashem, please don't select him. And this apparently, according to the Gemara, is okay. It's okay before the fact to say, Please Hashem, do not select him as one of the seven. The Gemara is bothered with the fact that having him selected, having saving him or uh, praying uh. after he's selected seems to be unfair. But it's not as unfair because you're asking before the fact, please Hashem, please don't choose Mephibosheth. And that the Gemara is okay with. That's not called Maso Panam Yesh Badavar because David is invoking a favor before the fact, not after the fact. So now the Gemara says, V'hakasiv lo yimsu avos albonim v'gomer. The Gemara asks the general question. What right did David have to do this? After all, you can't punish children because of the sins of the fathers. So, Amar Rabbi Chia bar Abba, Amar Rabbi Yechanan, Mutav sheti aker os echas min ha-Torah va'al yischal shem shamayim b'farhesia. A very dramatic statement. The Gemara says, better that a letter should be removed from the Torah than for a chilol Hashem to be made. Meaning, what is the Chilol Hashem? That people would say, look at this nation of Klal Yisrael, look how uh, cruel they are to those who convert to their faith. That's why the recent events and current events is such a Chilol Hashem. Because when converts are mistreated, this is a sign that the Jewish people are cruel. This is a sign that the Jewish people are uncaring about the lower class of our people. And so therefore, the Gemara says, in order to create a, in order to avert a chilol Hashem, it is appropriate to uproot this idea, this theological concept in the Torah, that children should not die for the sins of the fathers. Now this is theologically very difficult. I know you have a lot of questions on this Gemara. I already see it on your face. It's on my face too. There's a lot to discuss in this concept. But you see that this Gemara is telling us an idea. The idea is, is that if ultimately the image of Hashem or the thoughts of Hashem, the directives or the goals of Hashem are misconstrued by society, then it's acceptable for there to be a removal or a suspension of a particular mitzvah in order to realign the world's attitude towards HaKadosh Baruch Obviously, you can't. You have to know when to apply this. You have to have some kind of nevuah in order to know when to apply it. But th- this is the idea. Next, the pasuk then says in Shmuel, 
It says, Vatikach Ritzva Bas Aya es Hasak, Vatatehu lo el Hatsur, Mitchilas Kitsir ad Nitach, Maim Alehem, Minashamayim, Velonas no of Hashman Lanuach Alehem, Yomam Vachayas Asod Elayla. So it says that Ritzba, who was the mother of two of these people, after they were being hanged, they were there for several days. She stands out there every single day and every single night in order to be able to protect the bodies from the elements and from the birds and the animals. She doesn't want them to be, uh, their bodies to be mutilated in any way. So the Gemara says, What are you going to do with the halacha that says that you're not allowed to leave a corpse hanging more than a, just a few minutes? You're not allowed to leave a corpse hanging overnight, even if it's an executed corpse. Once again, the same theological principle. In order to create a Kiddush Hashem, it's, oh, it's acceptable for even a letter from the Torah to be removed. In other words, in order to uh, you ignore that commandment, in order to make a Kiddush Hashem. Because when people would walk by, they would say, hey, what's the deal with these seven guys whose bodies are being hanged? So, so the answer would be, they're princes, they're the sons, the grandsons of Shalom Melech. What did they do? They, they violated, they in some way offended, did something offensive to Geirim, to the lowest class of Jewish society. And even though it was the highest class of Jews, the descendants of Shaul, of Shaul, who did something offensive to the lowest class, nevertheless, the Jewish people believe in civil rights. They believe that every person is holy. And we will not tolerate, even from a prince, to do something improper even to the lowest member of society. But not, not Geirim in general. Here the Gemara seems to be saying that Givonim were the lowest class, not Geirim in general the lowest class. Geirim are at a very high level. No, I disagree with you. But we can talk about that later. Amru. So the Gemara says that uh, when people would see this, they said, wow, they said, this is amazing. They said, what an incredible people, that uh, it is worthy to attach yourself to these, to, to these people. He says, if this is the way you treat princes, even though they're the highest class of society, then how much more so should we, would, would the Jews punish someone who was just of an average uh, uh, st- station? And if this is how they treat lowly converts, then how much more, you know, if this is how they defend the honor of lowly converts, then surely they would defend the honor of even a natural-born Jew. You mean con- these converts who happen to be low, low, these are the lowly converts, because they were not as... That is your interpretation, and I respect it, but I'm, I'm, but I'm going to tell you that the reason why I disagree with you is because you're taking the bite away from the Gemara. The reason is, is because if we don't, if we explain the Gemara your way, then it takes away the concern that we need to have for Geirim even Bisman Hazet. Don't distinguish between Givonim and modern converts. The fact of the matter is, is that converts today also are the lowest class of Jewish society. And if we don't keep that in mind, and we don't remember that, then we stand to suffer the same fate as the descendants of Shaul HaMelech. Let's go weiter. Miyad nitosvu al Yisrael me'evachamishim elef. Once, the Jew, once people passed by and they saw this, they said, wow, I want to be a Jew. So 150,000 non-Jews converted to Judaism. Shenemar vayi lishlomo shivim elef nosei sabol u'shmonim elef chotzeiv bahar. As the Pasuk says later in Sefer Malachim, when it, we talk about uh, Shlomo preparing for the building of the Beis HaMikdash, it says <coughs> that he had 70,000 uh, schleppers, people who would carry the, the uh, materials, and 80,000 hewers, the mountain hewers. So the Gemara now says, "V'dilma Yisrael havu." Maybe they were Jews. How do you see that these were uh, converts? Lo salkadaitoch dechsiv u'mibnei Yisrael nasan Shlomo Evan. So the Gemara says, "No, we know that Shlomo did not make anyone else slaves other than non-Jews. So these people converted to Judaism on the condition that they become the Jews' slaves. So it must be that they were avadim kenanim. It must be that they were uh, Gentile slaves." 
So the Gemara says, Vadilma Dugzer Baalma. How do you see from there? Maybe they were just uh, Jewish employees. You don't see that they were converts to Judaism. Ela Mehacha. But rather, you learn it from here. That Shlomo relates, or Vayispor rather, he counts all of the converts that are in Eretz Yisrael, Vegoimer, Vayimtsu Meya Vachamishim Ela Vegoimer. And they find 150,000 people. So you see from that passer, and it's actually not 150,000 exactly, it's 156,000, I think, and 300, something like that. And he took 70,000 and conscripted them for being schleppers, for the temple construction. And the, uh, another 80,000 to be hewers from the quarry. So now the Gemara says, okay, fine. That's the story about how David was Gozer on the Givonim, who are now the Nisinim that's defined by the Mishnah. So the Gemara now says, U Nisinim David Gozer Aleihem? Moshe goes our alayim. Dirsiv mechotei veitzecha ad shoev meimacha. Morris says, We know from Parshas Nitzavim that Moshe says, Atem Nitzavim hayom kulechem, lifna Hashem elokechem. You are all standing before God today, all of the different classes of Jewish society, from the very chieftains down to the lowliest, which he calls the water carriers and the wood choppers. The wood choppers and water carriers were the lowliest class, they were the people that Moshe also. He had taken people who had masqueraded as being from outside of the Canaan territory and wanted to convert. Moshe accepted them, but because he saw that they were they were tried to deceive Moshe, he made them into slaves. So the Gemara says, so you see that Moshe was the one who was dec- decreed upon them, not David. And answers the Gemara, Moshe gozer le'ahu dara, David gozer l'kule dara. Moshe only decreed on the people of that generation but David decreed because of the cruel character on all future generations. We see in the Sefer Yehoshua that Yehoshua also had made a decree uh, on, on these people that they should be the slaves. He turned them into the woodcutters and the water drawers for the congregation and for the altar of God, which means that he conscripted these people to serve the nation and to also serve in the worship of the of the Mishkan. So the Gemara answers, Yehoshua Gazer Bisman Shabes Hamikdash Kayim, David Gazer Bisman Shain Bes Hamikdash Kayim. The Gemara says, You're right. Yehoshua also conscripted these people, but only as long as the temple or the Mishkan was standing. But David was Gozer upon them that for all perpetuity, even after the temple is destroyed, these people, because of their character, cannot enter into the Kahal Hashem. So the Gemara now says very, something very interesting. In the times of Rebbe Yehuda Hanasi, they wanted to permit Nisinim, these people who, uh, that we're discussing now, they wanted to free them as slaves and to make them no longer slaves. So, Omer Lahem Rebbe, but Rebbe says you can't do that because whereas we are the descendants of the owners of these slaves and these people are the descendants of the slaves which makes them slaves themselves we can free them from the portion that we own of them but the Beis HaMikdash or the Mizbeach owns a portion of them as well because they were made slaves to the temple so how can we free them when we don't have that authority so uh, the Gemara now says, "Upliga de Reb Chia Bar Abba, Dama Reb Chia Bar Abba, Amar Reb Yechanan, Chelak Eida La Olam Aser, Chelak Mizbeach Bisman Shabei Samikdash Kaim Aser, Ebe Samikdash Kaim Shari." So Reb Chia had dis- dis- disagrees with this. He says that you only have to worry about ownership of a slave by the Bei Samikdash when the Bei Samikdash is standing. Once the Bei Samikdash is no longer standing, so then automatically that slave portion is relinquished and the person can go free. So therefore, according to Rebchia, the only thing that you'd have to worry about is the free is the liberation of the portion of the slaves that were owned by Klal Yisrael, not the portion that is owned by the temple, because the temple is now destroyed. But Rebbe felt, no, you can't liberate them because uh, we don't have the authority to liberate the uh, the Mizbeach portion, the Beis HaMikdash portion. Both Rashi and Tosfus point out that this is not countermanding the original decree of David HaMelech. David had, had decreed them to be slaves, this Givonim. 
And all Rebbe was see, all the people during Rebbe's time were seeking to do was to free them from their financial obligation, from their financial debt. It's not necessarily that they were seeking to allow them now to marry into Klal Yisrael, because maybe David's original decree would have stood that since you're a descendant of the Givonim, because of your character, you're still not going to be permitted to marry. But the point is, is that you don't have to consider yourself a slave, you can consider yourself to be a full Ger Tzedek, a full convert, and therefore all of the halachos of a Ger would be binding upon that person. Let's go on to the next Mishnah. Amar Rebbe Hoshua, Shamati Shahasris Cholets V'cholzen Le'ishto, V'hasris Lo Cholets V'lo Cholzen Le'ishto. So Rebbe Hoshua says, I have heard that a sris, who is a man who is sterile, um, is allowed, is permitted to do chalitza, if he's the brother, the surviving brother, and if he's the decedent, then the brother of the decedent, uh, of the, who's the who's the sris, can do chalitza on this guy's wife, because basically what the Rabbi Yeshua is saying is that based on the first testimony that I heard is that as the fact that a man is a sris does not preclude him from the mitzvah of chalitza. So, so, but then I also heard, but then I also heard just the opposite, that if a man is a sris, he can't do chalitza, and if he's, if he's the decedent, the sris, then you don't do chalitza to his wife. And I don't have a way of reconciling the two things that I've heard. So Amar Rabbi Akiva Ani Afares. Rabbi Akiva says, "Let me explain." Sris Adam Cholitz V'Cholzin Liishto Mipnei Shahay Solo Shasa Kosher. Sris Chama Lo Cholitz V'Cholzin Liishto Mipnei Shelo Hay Solo Shasa Kosher. He says, "I'll explain." There are two types of Sris. One is a Sris who uh, who becomes sterile through injury, through some kind of trauma, and as a result, he is no longer capable of uh, of of having children. And that's a person who, because at one time he was a fertile, virile male, is subject to the laws of chalitza. So therefore he can both do chalitza, and if he dies, you do chalitza to his wife. But if a man was congenitally a sris, that let's say he was born without testosterone, so in that situation, um, you don't, he's not considered to be in the parsha at all of yibum or chalitza, and therefore he's not considered to be uh, subject to doing, uh, y- you don't do yibum or chalitza to his wife, and he himself cannot do yibum or chalitza. Rabbi Eliezer Omer Lo, ki ela sris chama cholitz v'cholzen li'ishto mipnei she'yesh lo refuah. Sris adam lo cholitz v'lecholzen li'ishto mipnei she'ein lo refuah. Rabbi Eliezer says, I hold just the opposite. I hold that if a man is congenitally born, let's say, without proper hormonal uh, development, there's a way to cure him. I don't know what the Gemara's cure is. I know that today we give the testosterone therapy to men who have low testosterone levels. So that's the way you could cure him. But let's say a man is a sris because he, he went through some injury, so his organs were permanently damaged. So therefore, he's not capable of, being, of having a therapy to cure him. That's where Rebbe Eliezer says he's not in the parsha of Yibam or Chalitza at all. So he learns just the opposite of Rebbe Akiva. So heyed Rebbe Yoshua ben Beseira al ben Magusa shahaya birushalayim sris adam v'yibam was ishto lekaim diver Rebbe Akiva. So Rebbe Yoshua ben Beseira gives a testimony. He says, I know that in Yerushalayim there was once a case where there was a man whose name was ben Magusas, and uh, he was a sris. He was a sris adam. He had uh, sustained a trauma at one time in his life, and that, therefore he was like say like a cruz shafcha, and. They did yibum to his wife in support of Rabbi Akiva Shita, who says that a sris adam is in the parsha of yibum chalitza, but a sris chama, a man who's congenitally a sris, is not in the parsha. Hasoris lo cholitz velo miyabeim. So now the Mishnah makes it just a generic statement, which we're not sure who it's how you reconcile it with with this previous machlokas. But we'll have to say that it goes according to Rabbi Akiva, and we're talking about a sris uh, chama. Or it goes like Rebbe Eliezer, we're talking about a Sris Adam. That a Sris may not do chalitz or yibum, and v'chein eilenes lo cholitzis v'lo misyabemes, and similarly an eilenes, who's a woman who herself is sterile, is not in the parsha of chalitz or yibum. And the, of course, the, what the mission is telling me is, since the whole objective of yibum chalitza is to be able lahakim shem laachiv, is to be able to procreate so that you can create a surrogate for the decedent. If you can't, if you're if you're sterile, either as a male or a female, you're not in the parsha of yibum or chalitza. Hasari shecholatz liyavim talo pasla, Then it says, if you have a sris 
who's not in the parsha of Chalitza. So basically, it's her brother-in-law, Shalom B'Makam Mitzvah, where there's no mitzvah of Yibam or Chalitza. So if he gives her Chalitza, he hasn't done anything really. And therefore, she's still permitted to a Kohen. She's not considered to be a Chalitza. If he has relations with her, then he, but there he's made her into a zona because she's, it's a forbidden relationship. It's an erva relationship. And any woman who enters into an erva relationship now becomes a zona and she's usher, she'd be less nus, but now she's usher to a Kohen. The chain island is shecholtzela achim lo posluha, bealua posluha, mipnei should be lasa be less nus. Conversely, uh, and, and parallelly, if you have, let's say, a woman who's an islandist, she's sterile. And uh, if she gets chalitza, it doesn't passel her from the kahuna because she's not shayach to chalitza. And uh, and if she uh, if she is um, intimate with one of the brothers, that's again it's called the bia pesula. She makes her into a zone, and she's not permitted to a kohen. Let's take a look at the gemara. Mechde shamino le Rebbe Akiva do amar chayve laven kechayve krisus dami the chayve krisus laven bnei chalitza veyibum ninu. So the Gemara is raising a question. It's a very interesting question. We know that Rabbi Akiva's shita throughout Maseches Yevamos is that a chayve lavin relationship, if the Torah says do not have a relationship with this person, Rabbi Akiva says there's not even tefisas kiddushin. There's not even a marriage here whatsoever. So how could Rabbi Akiva possibly suggest that if a man is a sris, so there's an iser deoris of him to enter into the congregation of Hashem, because he's like a cruz shafcha and a petzua daka, it's the same thing. He's not allowed to enter into the congregation of Hashem, so how can you tell me that his widow is subject to the mitzvah of Yibam? It's not really a halachic marriage whatsoever. So that's, that's the Gemara's question. Um, so, they, like Rashi says, and furthermore, how could Rabbi Akiva suggest that a sris can do possible can do um, uh, can do chalitza or yibum to um, to 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 his brother's uh, to to his deceased brother's wife? There's no marriage possible. It's like it's like doing chalitza with an erva, according to Rabbi Akiva. So Amar Rebbe Ami Hacha B'Mayas Ginon Kigon Shenasa Achiv Giro Giores B'Rebbe Akiva Sarva Lo Kerebi Yosi Damer Kahal Gerim Lo Ikri Kahal. So the Gemara answers Rebbe Akiva holds like Rebbe Yosi, who says that a convert is not considered to be Kahal Hashem, and as a result, there's no prohibition for a Sris to marry a convert. And therefore, in both cases, either where the Sris married a convert, it's a legal marriage, and therefore the brother is allowed to do chalitza with her. And conversely, if um, uh, if if um, if the if the yavam is a sris, there's no iser for him to do yibum to a convert, to do uh, chalitza to a convert, because it's no iser of kahal Hashem. She's not part of kahal Hashem. So the Gemara asks, Ihachi yivume nami miyabe. But if, according to that logic, then according to Rebbe Akiva, the Sris should allow, be allowed to do full-blown Yibo. Why does the Mishnah only say that Chalitza is the option, but not Yibo? So the Gemara says, you're right. You're right. According to Rebbe Akiva, who's trying to explain what Rebbe Yeshua had heard, in those cases where a person is a Sris Adam, he can even do full-blown Yibo. Right? It's not just it's not just chalitza, but because Rabbi Yeshua had heard it in terms of chalitza, Rabbi Akiva explains it in terms of chalitza as well. And I'll prove that to you, says the Gemara. Dika nami teketani heid Rabbi Yeshua ben Beseral ben Megusa shayvu shalaim sris adam veyibemu as ishto lekaim divur Rabbi Akiva shma mina. You see that the story that is illustrated to support Rabbi Akiva shita that a sris adam is capable of chalitza is a story about yibum. So you see that it's lav dafka chalitza, it's yibum as well. So now, the Gemara is going to challenge this, because now basically we're answering the question by saying that the only time that this is really possible is if we're talking about a Giyaris, if we're talking about where the Yavama is a convert. So the Gemara says, Masiv Rabba, Petzua Daka Uchur Shavcha Sris Adam Vehazakein, O Cholz and O Miyabimin. The Gemara, the, the Bryce over here is talking about any man who is not capable of reproducing. 
either because he sustained trauma to his uh, genitals or because he's too elderly. But in, in either case, you, th- these people, if they are the decedent, you can do chalitz or yibum to their wife. So if these men who are incapable of reproduction die, then you can do, uh, they are subject, all the laws of yibum and chalitza are applicable to their widows. So therefore, they're subject to a mimer, they're subject to a get, they're subject to chalitza. And if the brother has bia with her, then that's a full-blown yibum. Now, However, in a case where the decedent is not the Sris, but rather the Yavam is the Sris, or the or the Pitsuadak or the Khurz Shavcha, in that situation, granted that the laws of Yibum and Khalid apply to them, but if they do Yibum, they have to divorce them immediately afterwards, because the Torah says, Lo Yavo Pitsuadaka Bikal Hashem. And so you very clearly see Alma Bikal Askinan. So we see that the Brisa says that this mitzvah of Khalitza is even in a case of where the woman is not a giyaris, where she's because she says she is part of Kahal Hashem. So how can you tell me that the only time that Rabbi Akiva was talking about doing chalitza or yibam is in a case where she's a giyaris, you see, even when she's not a giyaris, that this halacha applies. And if that's the case, says the Gemara, we're back to our question. According to Rabbi Akiva, the yavam should not be able to do yibam or chalitza with this woman because there's no marriage possible. So, Ela Omar Rabba Kagon Shanafolo Ula Basof Nifza. So the Gemara answers, you know what, we're talking about a Sris who's the Yavam, but what happened was is that when his, his brother passed away and the widow fell to him for Yibam, he was still completely healthy. He had not sustained his injury yet. And therefore, since there's a Zika and she falls to him for Yibam, there Rebbe Akiva would agree that he can carry through on the Yibam. So the Gemara asked the question, But what are you talking about? The Zika should fall off in that case. As soon as he becomes a Pitsuah Daka, he should, the, the mitzvah of Yibum should, should now fly away. Because Milo Tanan, we have a similar mission that we learned before. Rabbi Gamliel Omer, the Mars question is based on the mission that we saw several weeks ago, perhaps months ago, I don't remember. The, the Gemara had said, the Mishnah had said that there's a case where two brothers, Reuven and Shimon, are married to two sisters. The Reuven's married to the Gedola, he's married to the older sister who's already an adult, and Shimon is married to the, to the Katana, she's still under the age of 12. And this is talking about where the sisters are orphans, and therefore there is only a rabbinic marriage that Shimon has with the younger sister. Ruvain dies, and the older sister falls to Yibum to Shimon. And as a result, Shimon is a biblically obligated to do Yibum, but rabbinically precluded because he's married to the sister, only rabbinically. So one option is for the sister, who's the katana, to do Miyun. She can opt out of the marriage. And then, as a result, it's possible now for Shimon to do the mitzvah of Yibam to her sister. But let's say she doesn't want to do Miyun. Let's say she wants to stay married to Shimon. We don't force her to do Miyun. And then what we do is we just wait for her to become a gedola, for her to become over the age of 12. And then, once she's over the age of 12, even though previously there was a Zika to Ruvain's widow, that Zika flies away. Once now she becomes a full-fledged Achos Ishto, the Zika flies away. So you see, Zika flies away even if it was originally there, once there's an Isser. So why don't you say the same thing here, is that once the guy becomes a Pitsua Daka, the mitzvah of Yubam flies away. It doesn't make any sense why Rabbi Akiva would say that she's subject to Chalitza now. So, Ela Amar of Yosef, Haitana Hachtana Devei Rabbi Akiva, so the Gemara says, I have to give you another answer. In reality, Rebbe Akiva, at least according to one opinion within Rebbe Akiva, holds that the only time that Mamzerus is a product of Chayve Lavin, so there's no Tvises Kiddushin at all, is only when the Isr Losase is because of a r- relation connection. 
But if it's not because of relation connection, when there's an Isser Lav, there is Tfisus Kiddushin, and ergo, there is going to be Chalitza possible. In other words, when we say that Rebbe Akiva holds, that any Chayve Lavin, there's no Tfisus Kiddushin, and therefore creates a Mamzer, is only when the prohibition is because of some familial connection that exists. But if there's no familial connection, but the Torah just says, Stam, you're not allowed to marry this woman, because let's say she's a Grusha to a Kohen, or something like that, then according to this opinion, Rabbi Akiva will agree that there's some kind, there is Tfisus Kiddushin, and therefore the mitzvah of Chalitza can be performed. And that's what our Mishnah is talking about. So the Gemara's question now is, Ikri kan lahakim la'achiv sheim v'halav bar hachiyu. So our next question is, how can our Mishnah suggest that a sris can do chalitza? If the whole objective of the mitzvah of Yibum is to perpetuate the name of the decedent, doesn't that imply that the Yavim has to be virile, that he has to be capable of reproducing, like the second part of the Mishnah had said? So why bichlal is this guy subject to the mitzvah of chalitza? Rava says you can't say that. Rava says you can't say that. You know why? Because every because if you're going to tell me that a yavam who's not virile is not able to do the mitzvah of yibum, then it's going to turn out that the same thing applies to when the decedent is not virile. If the decedent is not virile, then there's no mitzvah of Yubam, because just like he couldn't perpetuate his name, so too there's no mitzvah of the oven perpetuating his name. Well, then if that's the case, then you're never going to have the mitzvah of Yubam possible, because every man before he dies, one moment before he dies, he's not virile. Right? Whether you die because of natural causes or because of unnatural causes, that moment before death, you're weak. You've, your body is now physically weak and you can't reproduce. So therefore, there should never be a mitzvah of yibum. So that's Rav's argument to say that it's the, the, the criterion for being able to do the mitzvah of yibum and chalitzak is not dependent upon virility. So the Gemara says, L'Rebbe Eliezer, Piruka de Rava Pirchei. So the Gemara now says, Rav's argument actually presents a challenge to Rebbe Eliezer. Because what did Rebbe Eliezer say? Any person who is congenitally sterile is bichlal, not in the parsha of yibum or chalitzak. So if that's the case, according to that, so he says, well, then how could it ever be that, because like Rashi speaks out, he says, um, he says, He says, in other words, the Rashi basically points out, even though it's true that a man loses his virility before death, but if at some point in his life he was virile, so then he's shayach to the mitzvah of Yibam or Chalitza. That's Rav's basic argument. But what are you going to do according to Rebbe Eliezer? Rebbe Eliezer says is that even if a man was never virile in his life, he was born congenitally sterile, he has the mitzvah of Yibam or Chalitza, but how can that be? According to you, Rabbi Eliezer, what's the reason? According, I mean, if that argument is true, that there's a mitzvah of Yibam, but, uh, or, I'm sorry, that if a person is, um, uh, th- right, according to you, Rabbi Eliezer, that a Sris Adam does not do Chalitza, but then why, if a Sris Adam does not do Chalitza, then any man who was at one time virile and then loses his virility is like a Sris Adam. And therefore, according to that argument, should not be in the, uh, he should not be in the parsha of Yibum, and his widow should not be in the parsha of Yibum or Chalitza also. So the Gemara answers, Hasam kechishusa da aschalabe. So the Gemara says, in reality, a person who loses his virility one moment before he dies is not called a Sris. That's not called a sterile man. Uh, you know, you can run a, 10, a 10K marathon and you come home and you're totally exhausted. You're not at that moment a sris, even though you're not physically virile at that moment. All it means is, is that you're just wiped out physically. So that's not called a sris. A sris is a person who does not have virility because he no longer has testosterone. That's the difference. And therefore the Gemara says, just because you're physically weak a moment before you die is not what makes you a siris. And that's the difference. Rabbi Eliezer only holds that a siris Adam can't do Yibu, is not in the parsha of Yibu Merchalitza because he's t- uh, uh, hormonally he's not capable of reproduction. But if a person is just physically weak, that's not what makes him a siris, and that therefore he still is in the parsha of Yibu Merchalitza. We'll hold it here for today.